out in the far reaches of space. Many travelers are experiencing their own adventures. Others are conducting business transactions, with some being rather questionable, and small group claiming ownership of systems parting over those in their way. Then, out of nowhere, a ragtag team of friends created their own hunk of scrap of a void craft known as the Airbus to travel through the endless reaches of space to start their own adventures to find the sun and fight GOD! Welcome to Fate of the Aeroblos. Hey, how's it going? This video is going to cover some of the tips and tricks that I have found throughout my many playthroughs, and to hopefully pass on to you to help you on your future endeavours. If you already know about Fate of the Aeroblos, you can scroll through the chapters below to find a section you are interested in. Do note, this video was created during version 1.3, so some things have possibly changed throughout future updates. So, what is Fate of the Aeroblos? Fate of the Aeroblos is a VR chat recreation of the classic 2012 PC game Faster Than Light, or FTL for short. Similar to Faster Than Light, you're in charge of a ship known as the Aeroblos, where you have to manage a variety of systems and deal with multiple different encounters. The game is randomly generated, with quite a bit of RNG involved, so each attempt you go through is going to be a completely different experience. Fate of the Aeroblos can be played in both PC VR mode and desktop mode. However, there is no support for Quest. The world supports 1 to 5 people using either PC VR and desktop together, with the world being able to hold a maximum of 10 people. So if you really wanted to do a solo run with 9 spectators, be my guest. Sirix has made a wonderful instructions video that can be viewed just before you start a game, along with extra tutorials on how to operate each of the main systems. These go over the basics and the good to knows on how to play the game. We'll start off with some general ship good to knows. As stated before, you can play this by yourself or with up to five people. There are some slight differences depending on how many people are playing. For solo and duo runs, there are two repair bots and an automatic fire suppressor system. For trio runs, there is only one repair bot to use. Runs with four or five people don't have any additional support. Before you get on the Aeroblos, you have the ability to pick between four different classes. These are the four classes you get to pick through. The first class is Standard Crew, who are good all-rounders and balance in all skill levels. The second class is the Repair Crew. They can repair doors, systems and hull breaches a lot more effectively than other classes. However, they do have reduced health, don't shoot as fast, and will take longer to put out fires. The third class is the Firefighter Crew. They are immune to fire damage and can also put out fires a lot more effectively. However, repairing is a lot slower, their fire rate is also slow, and also they move a lot slower than the other classes. The fourth class is the Soldier Crew. They have increased fire rate on their pistol, as well as move a lot faster. However, their repairing and firefighting skills are very slow. When playing with other people, sometimes it pays to have a mixture of all the classes. Or you can go completely random and see what happens, makes it more interesting that way. Just make sure you test each of the classes, just to see what suits your playstyle. And lastly, don't forget to take a good picture. Now that you've got your class and your picture taken, we are all good to go to the ship. Welcome to the Aeroblos. When in the Aeroblos, there isn't too much to worry about at one time. There are 9 systems in total installed on your ship, 4 of them requiring manual inputs, and 5 of them running automatically. The two important automatic systems are Oxygen, to ensure you don't suffocate and the Engine, so you have a chance to evade incoming fire and also so you can jump through systems. The next two automatic systems to keep alive are the Med Bay, so that if you ever get injured, you can regain your health and Communications, so you always have a picture of your ship 
and you can use the radio button to talk with everyone playing the game. The last automatic system is the teleporter. You'll only be using this if you want to go to the station or a store. For the four manual systems, you have the shields, so that you can block incoming fire from damaging any part of your ship. You have weapons, which allows you to deal damage to opposing ships, which is a requirement to win this game. You have the hacker system, which allows you to hack the enemy's ship and disable one of their systems, as well as manage all the doors and vents in your own ship. And lastly, the pilot. They deal with all the dialogue options, navigating through the systems, manage upgrades and systems, and also the other requirement along with the engine, so you can actually evade incoming shots. When you start traversing the sectors, it is always a good idea to make sure everything is ready to go before you start any combat. A good feature is that combat does not start until all dialogue is finished. This gives you plenty of time to ensure there are no hole breaches, fires, or broken systems, as well as gives you enough time to ensure your shields are working and all your weapons are turned on. During this time, you can get a good understanding of what you're going to be up against. You'll be able to identify how many shields are active on the ship, and if they are using a teleporter. You are also able to identify what weapon types are being used, and also what weapons they have active. If you have the pre-igniter subsystem installed, you can target what systems you want with your weapons before the combat starts. This saves on precious time, and you can watch the fireworks from the safety of your pilot. Now that is what I call efficiency. Just be careful if there are solar flares, as this will still trigger before, during, and after any encounter. But this does make a good firefighting skill increaser. One nuisance you'll come across are intruders. These purple grin lords will spawn on your ship if an enemy has a teleporter. One to three will spawn at a time anywhere in the ship, and will roam to destroy any system they come across. If you start shooting them with your pistol, they'll change their focus from the systems onto you. These intruders take 10 hits to kill. I find that it is ideal to combat them in the mid bay, so you can constantly get healing. Or you can just keep moving around the ship to prevent them from being able to hit you. Do be careful, the intruders do have the ability to freeze you in place for a few seconds. And if there are multiple, this will stack. A good thing to start learning are the different type of weapons that can be used. Understanding what you are up against will make it easier to devise a plan on how to win the fight, or, if necessary, how you're going to escape. To better understand the different weapons, the World Gloom Plane 4 has an interactable display which goes through every single weapon in the game. From here, you'll be able to see what each weapon looks like. There are burst lasers, auto lasers, rail beams, beam type, shockers, piercers, heavy lasers, cannons, missile launchers, and flax. The basic laser, Grank's shocker, and all faction weapons are only used by the Aerobloss. An interesting functionality, which is different to that of faster than light, is to drain all of your fuel. This allows you to have two combats in a single jump, allowing for more resources to be obtained. This is the navigation map, which is what you'll be using majority of the time to jump through the sectors. Each system will have their own set of jumps to neighbouring systems. If there is a distress call, or a store that is on a neighbouring system, this will be indicated. Unless you have the long range scanner, you won't be able to identify environmental threats or the location of the station. Something I do a lot is I use an avatar that uses a pen to mark out each key point and also a path that I'm going to be taking. So now that I've marked each key point and a path that I'm going to take, I can swap out the long range scanner for a more useful subsystem. Mm. Do note that each sector you'll be jumping 7 times before you move on. Going over an already visited point will still count as a jump. You'll just find nothing there. As seen on these displays, 
You can see each crew member's skill level and their health. Skills increase over time as they are performed. Your health will decrease if the room you're standing in gets hit, there is a fire in your room, there is no oxygen in your room, or intruders are attacking you. You can restore your health by going to the med bay. If you run out of health, you'll be sent back to the spawn room with no way back to the Aerobloss until the pilot jumps to a new system. If there are fires in the Aerobloss, you'll need to use your fire extinguisher to put these out. Do note, if you stand in the same room as the fire, you will slowly lose health. Two ways to avoid this is either drain the room of oxygen. The oxygen level does need to be below 20 for the fire to be extinguished. Or stand in an adjacent room and use your fire extinguisher, since it does have a fairly large range. No damage taken. The last thing I want to mention about general ship stuff is the use of play space. Use this at your own risk as there are kill barriers located around the Aerobloss. Moving up. And now I'm dead. Welcome to Weapons. Here's where you'll be sending humanitarian relief packages to enemy ships that need it. On the display panel, you have all the information about the enemy ship you're in contact with. At the very top, you have how much health they have. Under that is how many shields are active. And off to the side, what weapon types are being used. The systems that are operational are the ones with the green bar underneath their name. From this setup, we can see that this ship has one shield, no teleporter, and is using kinetic-based weapons. Ships will have between zero and four shields and they can have either thermal, kinetic, electromagnetic, or a mixture of the three. If there is an active teleporter, be prepared for intruders. It's a good idea to pass on to your shield operator what weapon types are being used, as this will make it easier for them to protect the ship from incoming fire. At the bottom, you have your own weapons, as well as how much power each of them uses. On the side is your power distribution of what is currently being used and how much you have available. All weapons can be manually turned off and on to change the power distribution. You'll always start off a game with two weapons and three power. Only the pilot is able to change what weapons are in what slots and how much power you can have to use. The weapons can be selected individually or in groups to target specific systems. Most weapons require the shields to be deactivated in order to deal damage to the ship. Weapons such as missile launchers and cannons can pierce through shields. If you have a beam-based weapon, you need to make sure that the shields are deactivated in order for the beam to pierce through. In combat, you can leave some weapons charged, waiting for an opportunity to fight to deal maximum damage. This is effective if you have extra hull damage type weapons. Referencing back to learning about the different weapons, it applies here as well. If you have a beam-based weapon, such as the pike beams, hull beam, or the faction weapon Void's Choir, you need to make sure that the shields are disabled in order to deal damage. Shockers do not deal damage to the enemy's health, however they are great at disabling subsystems. Auto lasers and flak cannons are the two weapon types that will target any random system. Flaks are very good at disabling shields, but they do require four scrap to be fired. Some weapons deal extra damage to the hull, which can be seen on some of the displays. Targeting the hull will increase the damage output. If you are using thermal rail beams, these can pierce through the shields and damage the subsystem you're targeting. Cannons and missile launchers are the two weapons that ignore shields. To use a cannon missile launcher, you do need to make sure you have missiles in stock. If one of your weapons hits the ship when no shield is active, this will cause damage to the respective subsystem that you targeted. Dealing enough damage to each subsystem will cause certain things to occur. Damaging weapons will mean that the enemy ship will no longer be able to use some of their weapons. Damaging either pilot or engine will cause their evasion to slowly decrease. If either pilot or engine is completely destroyed, they will have 0% evasion, meaning any hit will hit. If the enemy ship is trying to escape using their Void Traveller, disabling either the pilot or the engine will delay this. Damaging the shields will mean they won't be able to recharge as many shields as they started off with. Disabling it will mean they can't recharge any shields. Destroying the teleporter will mean they will be unable to send intruders onto your ship. 
Do be careful. If the fire is drawn out for a long time, they will increase the repair on each system, making it harder for you to defeat them. I find it good to disable shields and weapons as fast as possible. That way you can maximize damage and negate the amount of damage dealt to you. The same way you can deal damage to their systems, the enemy can do the same to you. If all your shields are down, or they're firing a cannon or missile launcher, and they damage your weapon system, the amount of power available will slowly decrease. If you lose too much power, the weapon in the further slot will become disabled. It's always a good idea to have one or two extra buffer power, just in case the weapon system does get damaged. Onto shields, where things can get very hairy here, depending on what you're going up against, and if your weapon specialist is doing a good job or not. At the top, you have your buffers, which is what you need to have in order to recharge your shields. You start off each game with one shield slot, and can have a maximum of four. Each shield slot has three different types of shields. Depending on the fight, not all shields will be used. Hopefully the weapon specialist has told you what weapon types are being used. That way, you only know which shields to recharge. Kinetic and thermal weapons will disable only that respective shield. An EM based weapon will disable an entire shield slot. If the enemy has a beam weapon, such as a pike beam or a hole beam, you need to have at least one of each shield type enabled, otherwise the beam will pierce straight through. If the enemy is using cannons or missiles, you can't do anything to protect yourself, just hope that you have enough evasion and good enough RNG. After using a buffer to recharge your shield, a slight time delay will occur in order for that to replenish. There is an auto mode button in the center, which will automatically recharge the shields as they are taken down. This is a lot slower than doing it manually, but it does provide a little bit of protection. If none of these lights are lit up, then you have no shield buffers, meaning you can't recharge a shield. If the shield system gets damaged, you'll slowly lose the ability to have buffers. If you come across the environmental thread nebula, auto mode will not recharge any of your shields. The good thing about nebulas is that the enemy ship will not recharge their shields either. There is a recycle option at the top of the shield slot, which will put that shield back into your buffer. This is a good thing to do if you are running low on shield buffers. One good thing to learn is pre-empting hits on your ship. Some weapons are multi-shot weapons, firing between two to even five shots at a time. If you time it perfectly, you can use only one shield slot to block multiple shots at once. Even if the shield type is not brought down from a hit, putting a buffer into that shield type will still drain your shield buffer. So do not just hit buttons randomly or wildly. A common joke that has been brought up about playing shields is to play the game Os or Osu, depending on how you want to say it. This is because you're hitting buttons quite fast over multiple areas. This is the hacking station, which is responsible for two cool functionalities. You're in charge of opening and closing doors as well as earlocks, and the hacking component. There's three things you'll be using this side of the component for. First one, if there are a lot of fires, you can open each door and a corresponding airlock to drain the area of oxygen. Doing this will bring the oxygen levels down below 20% and will suffocate the fire. However, this will suffocate crewmates as well. If there's a breach on the aeroblos, you can open doors that are close to that breach to equalize the oxygen levels so you don't suffocate when you try and repair. And lastly, if one of these circles is red, that indicates the door is broken. You can actually press the button of that door on here and it'll fix the door without having to repair it. On the hacking side, this is the more interesting part and it's rather hit or miss. The aim is to navigate the chart from your starting position to one of the green indicators around the chart. The green indicators are one of the enemy ship's systems. Successfully hacking one of these systems will temporarily disable their system for a few seconds. Be careful though, if you are performing a hack and you fail, one of your own ship's systems will be hacked. This can be fixed by either completing the hack successfully, or having the virus firewall subsystem. If you fail and your weapons get hacked, all recharge times will be reset to zero. If shields get hacked, all your shield buffers will be lost. If your pilot gets hacked, then you lose all of your evasion. These hacks will last for a few seconds. The hardest part about getting to the system is having to navigate through many enemy nodes. There are five hostile nodes you'll come across. Two firewall nodes, which are there just to be a nuisance and block your path. A malware, which will decrease the attack power of your virus. A time bug, 
which will decrease the amount of time you have to interact, and a thorn, which will increase the attack power and energy of enemy nodes as you perform actions. Thorns and Maloya are the two nodes you don't want on the map, as this makes it a lot harder for you to navigate. When you encounter a node, this will lock off each adjacent node, making it unable to be interacted until it is cleared. You'll always have 10 seconds on the timer to interact with the board. This will reset after you do any interaction. If you don't think you'll be able to get from your starting position to a node, you can draw out the time as much as possible, hoping your weapon specialist can destroy the ship before you fail your hack. Some attempts you'll be able to find clean passages, others you'll just hit node after node. All nodes and your virus has an energy level labelled in green and an attack power in red. The energy level of your virus will go down depending on the power of the node you attack, and the energy level of the node will go down depending on the attack power of your virus. The last thing to note is you have four powers on the side that you can use. These will always replenish back up to one every time you start a new hack. You can find more of these powers as you navigate throughout the chart. If you want to get some practice in hacking, you can go to the world Gloom Plane 4, where there's an interactable hacking table, which will also go through each of the different levels. The last major system is the pilot. There isn't too much to worry about here. Being the captain of the Aeroblos means you get to make all the big decisions. As the pilot, you're responsible for dealing with any dialogue that shows up, navigating throughout the map, managing subsystems, weapons, and all the upgrades and the sole person responsible for making purchases at the store. You can upgrade the ship however you want, but some things that I have found has helped me get through certain areas are such as ensuring I have a second shield slot throughout Sector 2, getting a third weapon before I enter Sector 3. If I want to be a hacker, I either max that out, otherwise I just leave that level 1, ensuring there are enough buffers in weapons and shields to counter any damage that may occur. Getting a level 2 med bay as healing is very important, and leveling up pilot and engine as much as possible to increase the chances of evading hits. If you're in a battle that you can't win, you can wait for the void traveler to max out, and then you can escape the battle. However, you do need fuel in order to do this. It is also a good idea to save up scrap after combats, that way when you reach a store you can purchase new weapons, subsystems or even repair your ship. In my runs, my scrap level can vary very much as seen in some of these screenshots. There are 13 subsystems that can be used throughout your runs. You can only have 3 installed with a 4th one in storage. I'll quickly go through each of them and what they do. Med Bay Nanobots. This allows you to heal in any room other than the Med Bay, although this is at a slower rate. Weapons Preigniter. When you get into a combat, all weapons will be fully charged before you start. Weapon Reloader. This will decrease the charge time required for all your weapons. Long Range Scanner. This shows all environmental threats, stores, and the station that is located in the sector. Tracking Lens. This decreases the evasion of the enemy ship by about 7%. Shield Booster. This will decrease the time required for a shield buffer to replenish. Missile Replicator. This gives you a 40% chance to not use up a missile when you use missile launchers or cannons. Repair Robots. This will give you two repair bots that will roam the Aeroblos, fixing any system that is damaged. However, if there are intruders on board, they will not repair until they are removed. Salvager. This will increase the amount of scrap you obtain from defeating an enemy ship. Hull Repair Arm. This uses up a little bit of scrap after you complete a combat to repair about 1 or 2 health. Virus Firewall. If you ever fail a hack, the Virus Firewall will prevent your own ship from being hacked. Fire Suppressor System. This will install a fire suppressor in each of the main system rooms. If that system gets damaged, the fire suppressor will activate and put out the fire. Do note, if there's a fire in a hallway, these files will continue to burn until extinguished. And lastly, the mirror. All this does is provide a trusted user experience in the pilot seat. All games of Fate of the Aeroblos will have three scripted events. At the start of Sector 3, you'll have your first boss encounter with a Swedish overlord, Connie. This fight will always consist of Connie using four weapons and two shields. At the start of Sector 4, 
Connie will return. You will not be fighting in this encounter. However, Connie will put a bomb on your ship which will explode after they leave. This explosion will cause multiple fires and breaches to occur on your ship. The best way to counter this is to vent the majority of the ship of oxygen to vent as many fires as possible. After that, all you need to do is fix up any hull breaches or systems that are damaged. I personally position myself in med bay so that I can always have a way to regain health. On the very last jump of Sector 5, there will always be a store no matter what you jump to. This allows for final preparation for going to the final boss fight. Once you're finished with this final store, you'll be heading into two back-to-back -back boss fights. The first of the two boss fights is against Texas, Truck and Connie. Connie will be using four weapons and four shields, as well as periodically sending a barrage of six missiles at your ship. Once you have defeated Connie, you'll now go up against the Gilded Cage. The Gilded Cage uses four weapons, four shields, and has a total of 90 health, three times as much as you. Throughout each sector, there'll be other special events that can happen. Stores are used to buy weapons, subsystems, hull repairs, viruses, missiles, and fuel. There will always be three weapons and two subsystems in each store. These will randomize each time you visit. Sometimes, you'll come across a station. There are four terminals you'll be searching for. Scrap, missiles, fuel, and an item. The item will either be a weapon or a subsystem. Missiles and fuel are the fastest to collect, followed by scrap, and lastly the item. If you happen to collect an item, this will automatically be sent to the Aeroblos, even if you die. On that note of dying, if you die in the station, you'll be removed from the game until the next jump. If you want to have more time in the station, you can upgrade the teleporter. This will increase the time from 60 seconds up to a maximum of 140 seconds. You'll come to the teleporter and you'll have 60 seconds to explore the station. The station is very dark, so you will need your pistol with the flashlight enabled. You can also cheat by bringing your own external flashlight. However, this makes it less interesting. There is a way to cheese these stations. I won't tell you how, but you can get scores such as these. You will also come across distress signals. These can either be traps, a, trap. a fuel request, or maybe some other type of special event. Some of these will give very good rewards, while others are just plain scams. In total, there are three different environmental threats you'll come across. You have the Pulsar environmental threat, which will disable the ship map, and make it unable to use the radio. You have a nebula, which will prevent your shield buffer from recharging. This will also make the enemy ship's shield not recharge. You have solar flares, which will cause random fires to appear on your ship. There are other events that also happen. Just read the prompts and answer what you believe to be right. You never know, you might be lucky. There are six faction weapons that can be obtained. In the Alliance sector, you'll come across an Alliance member who is looking for Connie. In the Void, we will come across someone who's talking about a Dark Sermon. In the Aether region, where there will be an Aether Guard who might be generous towards you. In Belfagor's Cradle, where someone is in distress and looking for extra fuel. In the Nordly Cluster, where someone will talk to you about not being one with the mind. And in the Hunt Nexus, where there's a Chrome who is breaking away from the virus. Getting a faction weapon is not guaranteed. One answer today might be the wrong answer tomorrow. Currently, there are three difficulties and six challenges implemented in the game. What difficulty you pick will determine how much of each resource you get after a combat, as well as dictates the firing speed of enemy ships. Each of the challenges will change some type of aspect of the game, making it a lot harder to complete. As of recording this, so far there's only been one recorded person who has completed hard mode by themselves with five of the six challenges enabled. I have gotten close, dying at the final boss. There is a playable sandbox mode called God Mode. This will max out all your resources to 9000, allow you to spawn in a store, and is a great way for testing different setups. Do note, you can still die in this mode. This comes to the end of this hopefully helpful tips and tutorial video. I've possibly forgotten to cover over some things, or some things have already been outdated. If you are interested in supporting, or just want to be a part of the community, I've linked Serix's Discord, Twitter, and Patreon down in the description. 
I've also started streaming some attempts over on Twitch, as well as posting random things and results over on my Twitter. I do quite a bit of runs by myself, but also do it with my friends. However, occasionally I will jump into public lobbies, just to see how everyone's going. I hope you have fun out there, lead the Aeroblast to a valiant win, and not in a scrapyard.